and just make sure that we are doing our work on using it here or get Dan's attention on the way. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we're probably in our office. Yeah,
Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. If you can come and grab a seat, we'll get this rolling out. Thank you very much. get my glasses out of the way. Don't need those. I've ticked most people off, by the way, but there's the agenda if we need to keep tracking. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Better put my phone on silent. Everybody else has got theirs on silent too? Unless you need to be interrupted? Hey, Charles, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> right spot? Hey, look, um, thank you guys. Thank you for coming. Um, really, it's a pleasure to be here. You're our last road show of the series, so it's always nice to come to Gore and see a great turnout um, back in Southland. Wonderful. Uh, we are definitely here to share some updates with you. But really importantly, your views are sought on items that we want to talk about. So um, we want to make sure this is a listening and engaging roadshow, you know? So it's not here for us to just lecture. Make sure you voice up, ask questions, and make, make, a, make it clear. Before we get started, I'll just do the health and safety. So um, the toilets, if you're looking for them, they're just out this door here and to the right. Um, they're really good for washing off um, dirty crumbs of Afghan that you might have had on the way, so I've done that already. Um, so, but also, that is the way we will exit um, in the case of an earthquake or a fire. Uh, we'll, of course, we'll wait here to make sure the earthquake stopped rumbling before we exit out these doors. And I believe we're going to be assembling in the, where the entry was where we came in, but you'll walk right around the building to do that. So let's do that all together if it comes to that. Um, anybody here got a first aid certificate? Sharon, anybody? Okay, cool. So pick Jackie if I'm having any trouble, but otherwise I'm your first aider of the day. 
Um, but hopefully I don't think, I can't see us um, getting to that, but um, do feel free to tap us on the shoulder if you need a little bit of assistance. Righty, um, the agenda today. We've got quite an ambitious agenda and pretty much everywhere we've gone, we've gone a little bit over time. So we'll try to um, stick to the time we can uh, and warn you whether or not we might be going a bit late and we won't find it rude if you walk out on us. Um, we want to share our improve um, work with you. We want to share uh, the value proposition on single step. We definitely want to talk about the connectedness. Um, we have skipped some of the progeny test stuff to put in, squeeze on other things elsewhere, so I guess that could still be a little bit um, uh, of a, an optional. But the stuff at the end, we've allowed a good chunk of time at the end to talk about the things that matter to you. Okay, So it's a pick and mix type topics that we've pre-prepared. Or if there's something that's on your list or on your mind that's not on our list, you get to raise it here. Okay, um, This is a pick and mix group of topics that we had. We know it's too much. We can't talk about all these things in the time frame we've got. So if you don't raise it as something you want to talk about, we won't be talking about it today. I'll give you an opportunity and we'll whiteboard that in a few minutes, but um, just have a wee think and digest of that. If there's something on there that you want to say for later, I'm going to ask you about um, what should be on the list. Um, so with that done, I'm going to hand over to Dan Breyer, our um, GM of Beef and Lamb Genetics. If, here's Dan. Thank you, Annie. So just real quickly, thanks very much for coming. I just wanted to introduce myself, take the opportunity to introduce myself um, and to um, thank you for your, uh, thank you for your attendance and just to talk a little bit about how we've joined Beef and Lamb Genetics back into Beef and Lamb New Zealand, the larger parent organisation. So um, my background, I'm a veterinarian. Uh, I was, my wife and I had a farm in the Northern King Country that we leased for um, a few years. Uh, I've been with Palmu Landcourt for the last five years before I've come across to uh, Beef and Lamb and now Beef and Lamb Genetics. So um, I'm really, for me, farming's about, um, you know, the, the, the thing I really love about farming is the matching of a farm system to the farm environment and the animals on it and the people around it. So beef and lamb genetics and, um, and farming excellence are, for me, a great match. In terms of the larger beef and lamb New Zealand, um, no doubt you guys know this slide um, as well as I do, but what we, our job, the reason we exist is for profitable farmers, thriving farming communities that are valued by all New Zealanders. Uh, and in terms of the hard work that you do as breeders and part of the breeding industry, um, we, we fit in up the top here, right? Um, unlocking market potential, enhancing our environmental position, which is obviously so front and centre at the moment. The nice thing with genetics is we've got an opportunity to be, to be providing some solutions for the environmental problems rather than necessarily just um, looking at, at, at the problem side of it. And obviously supporting farming excellence. So um, helping our farmers and our wider farming community um, get, achieve excellence on their farms. I guess one of the, the cool things about joining Beef and Lamb Genetics with Beef and Lamb New Zealand is our ability to match up the bits that are aligned to each other but not necessarily working really well together. So for instance, um, one of the things that I'm responsible for is our science and research. And so we can make sure that the science and research that we're doing directly with ag research or with other research providers, um, our big hill country work that we're doing, um, actually lines up with what we're trying to achieve with um, Beef and Lamb Genetics as well. By the same token, at the other end, one of the things that Beef and Lamb does well is communicate with farmers and with the wider farming community. So we want to make sure that the hard work that you guys do, the risks that you guys take on behalf of our industry, we can make sure that it gets out and gets taken up out in the uh, wider farming community. So thanks very much. Thanks for your attendance and your input, uh, and thanks for your ongoing support of Beef and Lamb Genetics. That's me. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so the next few slides, I just want to have a chance to sort of explain to you what's still the same. Um, I've used this slide to describe us uh, at Beef and Lamb Genetics, wherever I've gone. If you've listened to a talk of mine, you've probably seen a slide like this. Uh, we're still very much about improve or the, in, the genetic evaluation uh, for, for the industry. We are very much about the sheep progeny tests that underpin those and make sure that those values are, um, are, are valid in commercial environments as well. We still do have an R&D arm, and it's you know, great that we've got to be able to link in with beef and lamb along that as well. We don't have our MB funding anymore, so it's not as big as it was, but we still do have an element or a channel where we want to bring the new um, research in to be uh, implemented in our programs. 
and we still have a beef component to our, um, our business as well. I wanted to explain uh, the, the heads that are still moving across to, to beef and land, and we've claimed um, a couple of ag research, or claimed Cheryl land with ag research at the back there, and Michael Lee at Otago as well. Um, but just to sort of start off with, we've got Dave here doing an improved project, and you'll be hearing from him shortly. We've got someone you might not have heard so much about, but certainly in their background is Jackie um, up here, working in the SIL operations in the background, keeping us together there. We've got um, Sharon, who you'll be hearing from, uh, on some talks and stuff today. We've got Pam holding us together in the back, making sure I turn up um, to all the right places that the, with the right amount of food and, and everything to run the day. Um, and with sh I want to also emphasise we still are a very science-based uh, organisation with reliance on you know, what Michael's been doing, he's here at the front, um, at, with a single step, and with Cheryl Ann helping us with our genetic evaluation. So we still um, do heavily rely on those and with Becky in our comms, um, so making sure that the information's getting out to you, and if it's not, it's something she's helping me wor with to, to get more and more, um, making sure our content is in your hands. And then just to think about um, adding on to Beef and Lamb, or linking into Beef and Lamb with, with Dan here at the head, but Susie Keeling uh, is a se uh, sector science strategy manager, uh, gonna get some, uh, her, hoping for some good leverage in there, and it's also where we're linking in with Eleanor um, where we can as well, sharing our office, so really cool. So just um, just to be feel confident that we're still a big team, we still have a, a presence and we're still doing um, work for you. We also consult with the Sheep Advisory Group. There's a couple of you in the room here. Um, and I just wanted to sort of acknowledge these people. They're people we're meeting with uh, quarterly or so, and it's you know, face to face is once, once a year, and other times it's teleconference. And it's a chance for us to use them as a sounding board and get a bit of a steer about how the rest of you might be feeling. Uh, we're trying to look for that breeder view, but also the bureau and the consultant and the f commercial farmer view. Uh, so if you're not feeling, if you're wanting something really raised and you want to sidle up to any of these people that you might know locally um, on that group, feel free to do so and they can bring that uh, issue towards us or to us on your behalf, or you can ask them for a bit of clarity if you weren't comfortable coming straight to us or didn't have the time to. So have a wee think about that. There's some names on there that you recognise that you could, um, you know, also have an avenue into us. So with that then, that's the introduction. Um, I want to uh, now just check in with you again about what is it, the topics that you want to hear today. I've told you the ones I want to tell you about, but I wonder if we could just whiteboard for a wee second uh, which of these that you'd really like. And I've really probably got room for about three. Um, but we have had some people tick all the list and we've ended up you know, going a wee bit later for those that want to do that. So just from, and if there's something that's not on this list that you want to raise, you can do so now too. So um, from the room, what would you like to hear? I'll just get a pen out. I, don't, I won't talk about anything on here unless you want it to be talked about. Okay, How, does everybody else feel the same? There's some shaking their head at the back there, Stephen, so you might be on your own. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, w uh, is there people interested in greenhouse gas? Should that go on the board? There's two at the back. Three, four? Yeah. So it's an option? Yep. Hey, I should say too, we're going to, we're live streaming and recording oh, yes. it, so we might use the throw mic a bit. Thanks, if, um, if you've got questions, that'd be great. Thanks. Whoop. It, and it doesn't hurt if it hits your head, eh? <laughs> Good work. So what is, what's a hot topic on here that you want to talk about? What's, what's a common one? What do you mean by visual scores? So Sharon's been preparing some work on visual scores. If you want to um, have some, present a few slides on that, she will. Put that on the list. It's nice and short. We might be able to squeeze a, another one in there. I mean, data quality is a really good one if you're not too sure. That's, it goes quite well, but... Yeah, I was going to suggest wool quality and or meat quality. Wool? From a bureau perspective, they'd both be handy. Wool quality, meat quality. Well, wool's only three slides, so that's pretty quick. Visual score's pretty quick, so. Mm. We'll try, it. if it's of interest. Well, uh, it, the visual, the visual uh, scores, I'd like to see them coordinating with the weights we're getting the weights we use. The visual scores? Um, Maybe we'll talk about it when we come through it, but no, it's not really going with your, you're thinking about condition score rather than visual scores? 
we're talking about like uh, how the conformation of the animal is right with its feet and its um uh, no, Yeah, doing a mate weight, it should be balanced with condition score. Okay, so you want, you've got um, this idea of adult size, which is a mating weight? Yes. With um, body condition score. Yep, that's come up. Any, Ashley, some Any yep. we've had um, facial eczema come up on the live stream. Facial eczema? So what I might do is, while you're doing the talks, I've got an Australian visual score book and one we put together for dairy sheep. If you pass that around, you'd see any comments later would be helpful. Okay. Right, well, we'll use that as our list yep. um, and we'll see how we go. Data quality? We'd love to talk to you about data quality and maybe we should squeeze it in um, after the connectedness, Sharon, again. What do you think? Yeah, we'll see how we get on. Okay. But Absolutely. Cheers, Andrew. We will. No, um, I don't need to rush out. Do you? No, no, no. The rest of the team? Yep. Cool. But by the same token, if you need to leave, don't feel just... We will not be offended. Cool. Okay. Right. Well, we'll be back on to our um, agenda, and the first person I'm going to hand over to is Dave with his improve work. Thank you. Um, has, uh, we sent out some videos uh, a couple of weeks ago, just with a throw of uh, a show of hands. How many people have had a chance to look at those? Okay, cool. Thank you. So we won't go through that again in, in heaps of detail, so I'm just going to put a patter over the top. But if there are any questions um, where you do want to dig in and ask any questions, just, just get stuck in and, um, and Dan will get the, the microphone to you. So, look, just kicking off, um, I know we, we covered the, the logic behind the, the changing across from the SIL brand to the Improved brand last year, but just to recap, uh, we've got the current uh, SIL system here on the left uh, with the different evaluations that run under it and the different tools that we push out to industries, both for breeder use and commercial farmer use. Uh, and then we've got the, the new Improved technology stack that we're building up alongside um, this, this, these systems are getting pretty long in the tooth, uh, starting to get pretty expensive to maintain and difficult to maintain. Um, and so um, the decision was taken uh, after a lot of debate um, to move uh, on to a, a new name. There are a number of reasons for that. Um, part of it was the fact that we need these systems to exist, coexist at the same time uh, while we're setting it up. Um, and, and you know, obviously helps if we've got different names for them. But also the fact that improvers, um, hopefully as you're going to see and have already seen, um, you know, stepping, stepping forward in terms of the technology that we're trying to uh, make available to breeders and, and the rest of industry. Um, and, and I guess the, the final point is, is also to be used um, for more than sheep as well so that we can get, we can leverage that investment um, and, and you know, get a more cost effective operating structure. Um, but the intention is, you know, at some point, once the improved tools functionality is where it needs to be, uh, that we will uh, decommission and turn off the, the current SIL technology stack. Our, our plan is at this stage, we're working towards winter um, next year, is, is the plan when we want to do that. But in the meantime, we're definitely at this point where we've got uh, both, both systems coexisting. Um, but as, as we're about to see, um, we are working hard to push some of that functionality out to you and to the rest of industry um, while we're still in this in-between stage when we've got both these systems up and running. Um, so yeah, so that, that's I guess basically the quick overview. Um, in, in terms of the, the um, content that we want to look at now, we really want to break it into two halves, um, just really show you what we've been up to in terms of the progress on the breeder tools and then we want to change gears and show you the functionality that we've been working on for the um, publicly accessible tools, mainly uh, focused on commercial farmers, um, and, and you know, hear your feedback in terms of what you think about those and, uh, and our plans in terms of how to, how to um, roll that out. Um, so 
Uh, next, we'll, we'll have a look at the breeder functionality, but just before we dive into that, does anyone have any questions, you know, just uh, in terms of the summary um, or an, an improve in general? Okay. So um, what I'm putting up on screen, and I'm sort of going to zoom this in and out a bit as we, as we go through to try and help uh, make it large enough on the projector, but um, what we're looking at here is improve um, for what it's going to look like for you as a breeder uh, when you sign in. Um, over here on the left of the main areas, uh, one of those main areas um, is views, and that's what we're going to focus on in, in, in this session. Um, there will be other areas, including um, data loading, and we can talk a bit about that you know, in terms of how we're planning to go about that um, in a way where we still preserve the integrity of of the evaluation later if anyone's interested. But for now, we'll stay focused on, um, on getting your data out, putting that in your hands. So you can think of a view as being uh, pretty similar to the reports that you would get from your SIL Bureau today, except as you're about to see, we really are trying to put that capability directly into your hands, but still in a way where you can get that support that you need from, from your Bureau as well. So when I go into views, you'll see here that there's a, a bunch of standard views that I can go in and use. In this example, I'll go into dual purpose and we'll have a look at the selection list and you'll see there's a bunch of sort of standard selection lists that we've gone ahead and created. I'm going to open up one of these. And so you'll see when that, uh, when that loads that um, it's sort of made up of two main areas, and this is a lot larger than it would be on your computer at home. I've just zoomed it up because we're on a projector. It would, would normally you'd have a lot more room for, for, for your data. Um, but on the left here, there's a criteria area. And so this is where we've gone ahead and said, look, you know, if you're doing a dual purpose use selection list, you probably only want to see your alive animals born uh, last year that are female. Um, but you can go ahead and change any of that. If you wanted it to be um, other sexes, I could go and change that. Um, I could change the years um, or the status if I wanted to include animals that have been culled. Um, but I could also, um, let's say I want another criteria that's, that wasn't provided by us. I can go ahead and add a new criteria. So I'm going to click Add Criteria. I want to add a criteria on an index. And in this example, I'll add a criteria on New Zealand maternal worth. So when I click Add Criteria, you'll see I've gained another one of these panels over in this area on the left. And so now, rather than seeing all 269 animals down here in the bottom right-hand corner, if I move this slider up and say we only want to see anything with New Zealand maternal worth above that number, or I could have typed the number in if that was quicker, when I reload, you're going to see that we now have only 46. And similar to what we um, can do in terms of controlling the criteria, that is, you know, what animals we're going to see in here, we can do the same thing in terms of the columns of information that we want to see. So, again, you can see we've put in here what we think is a, a good range of sub-indexes. But if I didn't want, say, DPG, I can go ahead and remove that. Um, let's say there's another column that's not here that I wanted to add. I can click Add Columns. And then I'll go and let's maybe add in some BVs. We could pop um, these two on. And you'll see those uh, additional columns have now been added on the right. I can reorder these columns. Um, I could put a sort on here. So let's sort by New Zealand maternal worth. Let's go descending to put our best animals at the top. So you can see pretty quickly, um, you know, you don't have to build this from the ground up. You can grab these views that are already there, but the aim is that it should be pretty intuitive for you to be able to come in and customize these. You can then save that view, uh, give it a name so that when you come back in uh, at a future point in time, it's sitting there ready to go with, with all the customizations that you've made. We've also um, put a lot of work in to make sure that if you want to get your data out, um, that there's a... Um, a good story there. So if I want to export that out to Excel, what Improve is going to do is um, create an actual Excel file, not a CSV file. So you're not going to face those problems where Excel drops leading zeros off, um, off 
sample barcodes or turns your tags into dates and all those sorts of things. Um, because Improve is creating a, an Excel file, we can completely control all the, the data types of the columns to make sure that everything um, that you're seeing is correct. And you'll see also, you get a nice wee cover page here that tells you, I'll make that a bit bigger, that tells you, uh, you know, what, what was in your view, what was the criteria that you had used and an explanation of, of the different columns. Um, so that's just a, a real quick run through of an example pre um, canned view, but one of those uh, views that's, that's there waiting for you. Um, your bureaus will also have the ability to create views and share those out to you. So when, when you're in, on the phone with your bureau and you're asking for you know, a particular, particular selection list, um, they can actually go ahead and, and make sure that next time you come in, there's a view that's been created along the lines of what you're looking for. Um, I'm, I won't save this, it's just an example, but just to, to give you an idea of some of the other functionality that's, um, that's in here now, um, you know, the example we looked at before, we were just pulling off a, an, an animal list, but you can actually get improved to do a bit of um, grunt work for you now as well. So I'm going to ask for uh, information on my flock. I want it summarised for my flock. I'm an administrator, so I need to enter my um, flock number. This is a, a research flock, so it's not quite going to give results like you would normally expect. But you can see, because we're summarising at the flock level, it can't list out all the tags. So it's, at the moment, it's just giving us a list of the tags or a list of the animals. And it tells us down below, it's probably a little hard to read. I'll make that a bit bigger. But you can see it's actually telling us about the assumptions that it's making in terms of how to best display this information. But the place where it gets quite cool is that if I wanted to build, say, a, um, a genetic trends table, I could go in here and I could say I want to add genetic trends, so I want to see the year, and I want to see the genetic trends, say, for some of my key indexes. So I'll pop New Zealand maternal worth and maternal worth plus DAG score as some examples. And you'll see it's smart enough to know that, um, uh, that because I put birth year on, I probably want to see the, the breakdown by birth year. And then it's going to give us those averages. And I could do other things too. I, could, I don't just want to see alive animals anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that. So I'm seeing all animals. And I could broaden the number of years out to, to go back further in time. Um, and it, and it, you know, I'm, I'm just really um, pitter pattering over the top, but you know, it, it is pretty smart. If I go in now and say add the sex of the animal in, it's going to do the same thing that we saw before, where it's now going to break down within each year by, by the gender of the animal. So we really sort of have tried to make it so that depending on which way you want to slice and dice your data, that pretty quickly you're going to be able to do that. Um, but you know, we, we haven't tried to recreate Microsoft Excel. That's already a very capable tool. So like I showed, you know, demonstrated before, if you're starting to want to do things that are beyond what you can do in here, that's when you would just pull the data out into Excel and, um, and, and do that on your own computer. So that's, um, that's pretty much everything I, I plan to demonstrate, unless anyone's got any, any specific questions. Um, we had planned to have had this in your hands by now. Um, we're really close, as you can see, to being able to push it out. We've just got one, one remaining issue we ran into our, uh, with our testing where if you used an outside sire, those aren't showing up properly because Improve is trying to be you know, paranoid about making sure everyone's only accessing the information they should. And that case is, is being a little too careful because if you've used an outside sire, obviously in a sire summary, that needs to be there. You've used the sire. Um, you, you have a right to, to see that information. So we're just getting that put on at the moment. Um, we've got um, the plan is to have bureaus in there and some of the breeders that were involved in the workshops late this year to get um, feedback in and then um, a more widespread um, availability of that um, out to breeders uh, early next year. And then um, in the latter part of next year, we're expecting to be working through that process of enabling data loading uh, just one thing I'll say on that is that the right to load data is something completely separate from the right to approve data to move into the evaluation system. Today, when you send your information to a bureau, it's reviewed before it makes its way into the evaluation system. The permissions model that we've got in Improve follows that same convention. 
So we will have the dial set right round to, to the most cautious level we can when we kick this off. Um, and, and any data files that are able to be uploaded by bureaus, sorry, by breeders, will still be reviewed and approved by bureaus. Sharon's got a, um, a point coming in uh, later on around data quality, um, and you'll see a bit of a tie in there in terms of what we may be able to do. A question online too. Does it show the genetic trend graphs? Yeah, great, great point. So no, at the moment we don't have any graphing capability in Improve at the moment. We've just sort of got it to that point where it can pull the data together. At the moment, if you wanted to graph it, you'd have to do that in Excel. Um, but, but we have scoped that piece of work and, and are hopeful we can get that funded for the future. So I'll just stop here at the breeder, at the breeder side and just get questions before we switch across and look at the public access commercial farmer screen. Are you only going to be able to see your data? You're not going to be able to, look, like with REM Finder now, you can look up any REM and find all his progeny. Great, great question. So at the moment, this is just focused on you working on your data or bureaus working on their clients' data. The next screens that we're about to switch over to, those are the screens that are for the finder type access, the, the public access, where you can look at each other's data. So that'll give you the same as what we've got now with REM Finder? I'll, I'm hoping it'll, it'll take us forward from that, right. but I'll, I'll ask your feedback once I've shown anything. you. Yeah, right. yeah. Thank you. Just briefly, will it work on a tablet? Oh, great question. Yes, it will. Um, and um, often I can actually do a demo here where I'll pull the view up I've just made on my mobile and it will readjust itself. It, some things drop away um, and also a tablet will look more like what you're seeing at the moment. Yep. And that's iOS and Android. Um, but you do need an internet connection. Yep. Any other questions about the breeder functionality? Okay, um, but just, just get stuck and, and feel free to grab me afterwards um, if you think of anything later on as well. Uh, where were we? Oops, let's jump down. So, um, so now, as promised, we're going to switch across now and start looking at the commercial farmer screens is, is what we're labeling them. But you'll see there is advanced functionality in there for breeders as well particularly around connectedness, and that's one of the topics that we're going to ask for your feedback um, today. So, um, so the first thing was, in the, um, at the Sheep Breeders Forum, we asked those questions about how you felt, you know, about the level of information that was being shared, whether there should be more or less. Um, we got pretty uh, positive feedback in terms of the current level of sharing. So for now, we, we have kept this sharing the exact same information that's available in those tools today. Um, this is obviously a big part of our commitment um, to deliver value to levy payers, um, the majority of which are commercial farmers who fund the majority of, of SIL. Um, it incorporates breeder feedback. Um, I could probably have a couple of slides of breeder feedback on the current tools, um, but, but um, there was a lot of criticism about um, the ordering of the results not being particularly fair. Maybe it advantaged the larger flocks. Um, that New Zealand maternal worth and terminal worth, um, although a good um, representation of an average animal, you know, the reality is that each commercial farmer has a different set of requirements and, and is there a less blunt instrument, something more precise about the, the individual needs um, that we could do. Um, and then there were some other um, points there around some breeder features that were requested and, um, um, and, and, and other things, but ho hopefully you're happy with um, that, that that's been incorporated in, in, in what you're about to see. And then we had a lot of commercial farmer feedback as well um, around you know, the current um, intuitiveness of, of the current tools. Um, they wanted something more visual and um, didn't want to be drowned in numbers. You know, breeders know inside out what a good index number looks like for a commercial farmer that's only doing that at, at certain times in the year. Um, that, that can be a bit more challenging. So, so you'll see that, um, that we've uh, incorporated that in, into the tool. So I'll just get myself s switched over. So uh, what we're looking at here is, is code. This is development that's being worked on right now. Like this software will be, will be fresh out of the oven from the dev team. So, um, so it's still a, a work in progress. Um, 
but the idea is uh, it will readjust itself if you're on a mobile device and look a, a bit different to this. But you can see it sort of spread itself out because it can see we're on a, on a laptop computer. The first choice really is are you looking for a, a terminal or a maternal animal? In this example, I'll go maternal. And you can see then that enables all of our, our um, buttons where we can say what it is we're looking for. The first of those is what traits do I want? Now I'm going to zoom this up. It um, might get a bit strange on screen, but I'll just try and make that as big as I can. Um, and you can see this is um, effectively building a, a breeding criteria. So as a commercial farmer, I can say, look, I'm, I'm looking for a well-rounded animal, so I'd like to be in the top half of, or thereabouts, of New Zealand maternal worth. Um, let's say I'm on particularly challenging country, um, and I've already got really good reproduction. I don't want to be straying into triplet territory, so I actually might want to pull the top of that down to, um, to, to not um, move into the extremes there. But survival is really important to me, so I want to be up in, in survival. And you'll notice as I set these sliders, this bar keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller to really um, communi communicate the fact that you can't have everything. The more I ask for, the, more, um, the fewer choices I'm going to have. Um, and all the other indexes are here as well, so I'm going to ask for some body condition. It's particularly important to me. Um, but you'll see... Um, as well as the health indexes, the, um, the production indexes are there and available to me too. Um, now I can go ahead and, um, and look at, uh, and, and there are other options here, but um, for now I'm just going to skip over those. But you know, much like trade me, I can narrow it to regions, I could narrow it to reg uh, breeds, change the year of birth, change my um, sex options. I could exclude certain flocks that, um, that, that I've already looked at and I'm not interested in. Then there's an advanced area, we'll look at that in a minute, uh, but for now I'm just going to assume that I'm all good and I just now want to start looking at my, um, at my results. So you can see it's highly visual. There's, there's actually, in terms of the bars along here, I'll make that bigger. See how big I can get that. Um, these bars along the top, you'll see, um, you know, it's just the icons, um, but if I'm not sure what any of these icons are, I can just click on it and it will take me to a, um, a page where I can see you know, exactly what they are, what the index values are, um, and the full name. I'll just point out one thing uh, for the eagle-eyed. The percentages are the, that we're going to flip those around. So when we say 91%, that'll actually be communicated as top 9% to be consistent with the current tools and, uh, and, and other species. Um, I can also uh, see the recording status for this, uh, for this flock. And again, if I'm not too sure what any of this means, I can click on any of these and I'll get a, a full description. The terminology that we've used in, um, in Improve uh, for commercial farmers or for the public facing is not connected, but benchmarked, uh, because that was the, the word that communicated um, the meaning most effectively. Um, so you'll notice that there'll be no mention of, of connectedness in here, but that they're the one and the same. Um, and the bars, um, basically what we do, so we want to be fair to the smaller flocks, but also to the larger flocks. So what we do is we go to the flock, we look at where the sliders were set, we narrow that down to just a subset of animals that look, matched what the commercial farmer was looking for, and then that for that subset of animals, and it says how many relevant animals that is, we then show the average percentile rank for those animals that matched what the commercial farmer was looking for. And we think that's the best way of being fair to the smaller flocks, but also not disadvantaging the larger flocks that could have a more diverse range of animals. And then finally, um, we take that and we calculate a likeness, a likeness number. Now we'll do a separate video that gets down to the nitty gritty of how we do that, but in short, we look at the traits or the indexes that the commercial farmer said mattered to them, the ones where they moved the sliders, and we look at, of those animals that you have that match what they were looking for, we look at how well optimised or how far to the top of what they asked for your animals are, and then that's how we dis decide how to order them. Now I can still go ahead and override that, I could still go ahead and sort on 
um, the breeder name or the number of relevant animals. But we think that this is a fairer way of default sorting the flocks that is fair for both small and, and large flocks. And we'll, we'll definitely invite your feedback on that. In terms of connectedness, the way the tool works at the moment is when, um, whenever, like if I'm in maternal, it's got to be connected for New Zealand maternal worth. As soon, I don't know if you noticed, I can go back to demonstrate, but as soon as I moved that DAG score slider, you saw it drop quite quickly in terms of the number of animals. Because as soon as I say I'm interested in DAG, because we want to be able to show the DAG bars and make sure that they are benchmarked and comparable, then it, at that time it's only those that are connected for that goal trait group. And then just, just the final part of the demo, um, to link it back to um, uh, RAM Finder, um, I can actually flag as a way of sort of tracking what I'm interested in. I should also say, sorry, that these, these numbers, breeder, five, seven, eight, and, um, and the farm names, these will not be displayed like that. It will show your actual flock name and your actual farm name. We've just anonymized them at the moment while we're testing the tool. Um, until we're sure it's calculating the right numbers before we start throwing um, breeder names up on there. But um, I can, um, you know, if I click more info, you can still see, you know, who the actual old breeder is and, and make contact with them or go to their website. Um, so I'm going to flag one more. I'm going to say that I only want to see flagged flocks. So I can sort of put a pin in those flocks that I want to follow up with. And then I can also go look at some example animals. And it's going to do something very similar to what we just saw, except now instead of uh, summarizing the percentile ranks of the, um, of the flock, it's now showing them for those actual individual animals. Um, as promised, the, there is the advanced area. Um, you can you know, tell it you want to see the percentile values or the actual breeding values, which we suspect a lot of breeders will want to do. You pop on custom indexes, there will be a breeder login area that will give you additional functionality. But I guess that's one of the topics we did want to um, ask you today is, you know, how we should best handle connectedness in a way that's fair. Um, our initial thoughts were that you really had to be a breeder before you'd be able to come in and turn the connectedness restriction off. Um, but, but maybe, maybe um, that the room may have a different opinion. So. With that, I'll, I'll stop talking and really throw over to, to questions from the room. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. All, all of the people want to hear what you're saying. Sorry. If you click on the wall icon, what comes up now? On the wall icon? Yep. Uh, so if I click on that, it'll just bring up the... Um, uh, sorry, it won't do, I should, um, this is code that's still being worked on, I'll do it on the, on the flock. So it would just bring this up and so it would show the uh, index value and the percent, average percentile rank for wool for the animals, that meet the, the animals that meet the criteria in that flock. So that's based around wool quantity at the moment? Okay, so will that change to wool value in time? <coughs> If you have the um, wool quality module stood up, it, it's an additive index, so you can have the wool, which will still be quantity, <coughs> and you can have an additional quality, which will take into account colour and fibre diameter, and added together gives you, you know, the total value. Other anyone have any comments in terms of connectedness or any other questions? Just you were saying before you could take the connectedness off, where does that get you? Well, um, and Sharon, what way in here? But I know there were two scenarios. Um, the main one was breeders looking for other animals and, and are aware of the implication of, of where um, the gold trait group is not connected. Um, the other, Sharon, was I think there were some examples with some new traits that are still, that aren't quite connected yet. Um, for, for the first one, it, some, some of the smaller breeds are quite well connected to each other, but not particularly well connected to NZGE. So they want to be able to search amongst their group. Um, in terms of the new traits, I can't, yeah, the answer doesn't come to Sorry, me. Sorry, that was the example I was trying to, yeah. I butchered. Yeah. So we've got some of our smaller breeds that, that aren't as well connected to NZGE, but can be well connected to each other. And breeders are more, 
close bay with what connectedness means versus commercial farmers. But some commercial farmers may want to see an unconnected flock if that's who they're buying off. But it, there's a bit of sophistication to understand that they may not be benchmarked correctly and so the values aren't comparable. So some people just say we'll make it really clear by turning it yellow, but it, it still does require a level of understanding. So we're pretty cautious on that one. Um, yeah, similar question. I think you've answered it basically. So if I'm a commercial farmer looking on here, will flocks that aren't connected not come up basically? That's exactly right. So yep. at the moment, the way we're heading, they would not. There will be a switch that we'll put into the advanced area. And I guess the question, the, the, the question that we're trying to work through is should that be only for breeders or is that something that should be available for commercial farmers? And we would, you know, we're imagining there'd be some disclaimer that will pop up that would warn them in terms of what they're seeing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the question. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, if a commercial farmer decided to select every criteria, David, yeah, yeah, is anybody in the country connected to each other? Uh, if you if you go for every criteria very quickly, and Sharon, you got a great example from from something in the past, but very quickly, there's nothing left. Exactly, um, and so you you see that up the top here on this bar. So some of the, particularly some of the house traits, there's very few guys connected, let alone doing the measures. So at what stage does it become irrelevant? Yeah, so at the moment, we're just relying on this bar getting smaller and smaller to make the point. Um, but um, but we, we will do something like, the, uh, we've been talking about an idea of, you know, once they move their fourth slider, that we may um, need to pop something up to say, you know, you, something to the effect that you can't have it all. Um, uh, I'm just going to say, for the commercial farmer, but they're not going to understand a fair chunk. Why not have a simple graph that comes up when they click on there to start with? The, this is your percentile beans, top 5%, 10%, 20%, 50% of animals that are on your list that they're selecting for. Yeah. Just um, like your Angus Pure Index, you look around at a, any bull catalogue and they tell you exactly where the averages are in the country. Yeah, so great point. And I should say too, we've workshopped this extensively, including a bunch of other designs with commercial farmers. So there's been a lot of commercial farmer input. The, I guess the, the two key differences were um, in, the, in the beef example, and same in dairy, those in, there's few indexes and they're very well known. And every, there's probably um, whereas the feedback we've had from commercial farmers and breeders that in, on the sheep side, the different breeding objectives are more varied. And so this is what we're sort of trying to reflect here. Rather than it being a big drag race all on the same animals, the reality is that there are actually a lot of different scenarios that commercial farmers are, are chasing. And so we're trying to create something that um, sort of enables that, you know, fit for your purpose, I think is the tagline in here, something along those lines was, was why we had to deviate from that. So it's not still good to see where those bands are though, like if you wanted to pick for carving ease or say you, that you put your main pressure on that, you still see where those percentages are. Yeah, and, and so you can do that. Like you probably saw before when I went in, um, if I click on it, because we, and we did have some commercial farmers that did say, look, I just want to see the numbers. Like I do want to know what the percentile is, but I just want to see the, the damn um, index values. So they can still click on it or turn that on and see it. But the, the majority of our commercial farmers, the feedback was the number's not important. I want to know what that means in terms of what I'm selecting from. They really want to see that percentile rank. Yep. Hi David. Hey, just a question regarding the mid-micron index that we currently have in SIL. Is that going to be visible for breeders and commercial farmers? Or is that part of the wool quality model being revised at the moment? To um, the production indexes, there is a fine wool index there for the for the Corridor people. It's a wee jersey, I think. Um, yeah, was, yeah, that's it there. So, so it is in there. And but the 
the mid-microns will be shifting to DPW plus DPWQ as the combination that will meet their needs. So, yeah, so that it'll, there'll be an additional DPWQ index in here. Yep, one last one and then. Genetic trends for individual breeders, for individual traits. So um, when we asked the question of, at the last Sheep Breeder Forum about what information we're not sharing today that we should be sharing, I think that was the number one, if not it was the number two suggestion. Um, that is something that we're looking at. I guess we thought this was a good starting point because this is based on the same information we're sharing today. And then once we've got this sorted out and that habit uh, being developed and, and in terms of the integration that Dan was talking about, the um, you know, integrating this into the beef and lamb commercial farmer extension is obviously going to be really important. So we figured that's sort of our crawl or walk and then engage in that discussion with breeders around things like genetic trends and other ideas that, we've, that have been given to us about other information that could be in here and you know, should it be for everybody should be opt in and, and go through those conversations as a, as a second step. Yeah. Um, just, just before we wrap, if um, uh, I'll be around afterwards, please make contact. My contact details are on the SIL website or any of the team here. Um, I should say too, like what you're looking at and all everything that we've looked at today is the combination of all the people that Annie put up on the slide earlier heaps of input from breeders, bureaus, and commercial farmers in the workshop. Can't emphasize how valuable that's been and how much what you're seeing changed based on that. Um, but can I just get a show of hands in terms of, you know, what you're set, I, I should have also said, sorry, that um, in terms of where we're going to from here, there'll be a link sent out to all SIL flocks and bureaus, so you can actually go in, use the tool, and have a look. Um, then we'll make it available to the commercial farmers that were in the workshop so that they can have a look and give us their feedback. And then once we've had a chance to work through that, then the aim is to really make it quite a soft and progressive launch. We'll start making that available, um, but really not until next season when we, we do a really big push in terms of this tool to give everyone, I guess, a chance to, to come to terms with it and a chance for us to get, get feedback in as well. Um, just with a show of hands, can I just get some feedback? Um, if um, I'll just keep it simple. Um, if you don't like it, um, if we can get uh, a show of hands on, on those first. And then just um, no hands if, if you're neutral and if you do like the direction we're heading, a show of hands. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Andy. Sorry, I've run over a bit. Well, that was really good uh, conversation. It's exactly the thing we're looking for. So um, thanks for that. Um, where am I at, Dave? Um, on your screens, and now I'm moving on. Right, Alex? Value proposition. So um, just wanted to take a wee minute to um, talk about single step and remind us what single step does. Just to um, that it's about. The single step is referring to the fact that we were combining the pedigree, the phenotypes and the genotypes all together in one single step into the evaluation to generate the breeding values. So instead of doing a um, you know, mix and match and then blend later, it's blended in one single step. We know there are benefits. Um, we've increased the accuracy of the breeding values, um, that, that the value spreads across close relatives of genotyped animals. We get improved predictions, particularly in the young animals, which we really are, are caring about. And we're getting a better comparison between the genotyped and non-genotyped animals. So cool stuff. But the accuracy, like reporting the accuracy, has been a bit of a, a problem. So that it, it, there's nowhere globally that has got a, a, an acceptable math to be able to report accuracy, um, or to a level that we're satisfied with anyway, for, um, for the extra accuracy it's bringing. So we've chosen to do the reporting conservatively is pedigree accuracy alone. So we know it's doing better, um, but we're giving you a conservative uh, accuracy prediction from that. But that makes it hard to figure out the value of, um, of the genetics. I want to remind you that it's for the maternal breeds only. It's for the Romney, Coopworth, Perindale and Composites. That um, health traits, generally the reporting is restricted to those recording the trait. There's a few occasions where those rules can, uh, that it's legitimate 
to um, open that up for um, when it's an accurate um, genomic prediction, but generally it's restricted to those recording the trait. And the breeding value based on just doing the genotype alone is a yet to come. It's a work on that we're still doing. It's not yet for terminal breeds. So um, there are genomically enhanced breeding values that are provided through this SIGC, so the South Island Genomic Calibration Site. So there'll be some participants at that site in the room. So you're getting genomic breeding values for meat quality traits. They're not coming for maternal or for terminal worth traits. But we know this is still a work in progress. We want to be able to spread this out. And one of the questions we're still hanging up on is, will we be doing a single step that's maternal and terminal together in one single step? Or will we have a maternal single step and a terminal single step separately? So this is a work on as part of what um, Michael's got in front of him to, to be solving over the next wee while. Recommendations around genotyping, so we still um, are recommending using a mid to high density chip, so 50k or 600k good for the size that you're using, the ones that you're um, using in your own flock. That all progeny that are going to be candidates, or candidate replacements, using a low density chip, I think it's actually supposed to be more like 15k, sorry I didn't fix that anomaly there. Um, but it doesn't have to be all progeny, and there are some cases still for parentage only, um, if that um, fits for you. But what about the value? So Michael's come up with this idea of doing a scenario approach. So we just come up with a scenario, uh, or what we thought might be a typical situation. So thinking about your, your stud flock having around 1,000 ewes mated, that you're using 16 rams, with 12 of them being young and four being older, so you're getting the year-on-year -year connectedness or getting more progeny from a really good ram. And so it's pretty a high ratio, but just to see this is what we put into the scenario. Um, looking at 140% weaning to use mated, so getting 700 ram progeny out, um, and 12 of those being retained, so they're becoming that, those 12 young ones, so you're replacing 75% of your ram team annually, and thinking of it's a, equating to around 2% selection pressure on the, from the ones that are weaned. Um, of the ones that have you've, uh, of the rest of that ram group, that you're selling 200, so around 30% of the rams sold for those that are weaned, and having a 30% replacement on your ewes. So just that first question, does this sound like a typical scenario? It won't be everybody, somebody will have a little bit more, a little bit less uh, and such, but is a fair typical starting point? What do you think? Is there nodding? Not so nods? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is exactly the same information but in a graphic, so if you're not a table person like me and maybe you like pictures of sheep better, so it's the same information, about a thousand ewes, um, this is that replacement, 30% replacement, um, you're getting your 12 new rams uh, from this, this group here and having the other ones sold, so your candidates to, uh, you might be testing. Today we're going to describe the benefit of genomics over the pedigree alone and it's based on the New Zealand maternal worth. It has been calculated for DAG and facial eczema, worm fear can meet, but today we're just going to focus on the maternal worth value. The benefits we're describing are for your RAM buyers, okay, so for those that are actually coming to, to um, purchase your RAMs. We're considering one test year and it's calculating the benefits over 10 years with a 6% discount per year because um, a dollar today is not exactly the same as a dollar promised tomorrow. We're assuming a cost of $30 per RAM genotype from this candidate ram, and if you are doing DNA parentage already, that it's an $8 extra cost to get that genomic. Okay. Just, um, you're thinking about the benefit you're going to get from genotyping your titties, so you can be doing almost all of them, down to a few, and if you have a look at the value that you're going to get from that, so on this scenario, doing, a, doing more animals, close to all of the ones that were weaned, you're getting $114,000 benefit over those 10 years, or your RAM buyers are. It's going to cost you more, and so the return on, it's going to cost you as a breeder, I suppose, more. Um, and so this return on investment is your investment um, and the, the return that your clients are going to be getting. You can test fewer and have less benefit, but it's cost you less, so the return on investment's getting a wee bit higher. Um, and I'm not here to tell you which is the right thing for you, it's about your appetite for, for what your um, spend and the cost benefit for you and your clients would be. Yeah. So it changes if you go younger. Okay. 
the, just comparing it with the DNA parentage cost, so just thinking about the extra you've got to do to be able to go from parentage to genomic. So it's costing you an extra 5,000 to, to do all of the, or pretty much all of the animals. So your return on investment's um, here, and then you could do fewer of those um, animals with that extra cost. You know, not being quite so expensive and getting a higher rate of uh, return on investment, but it's, uh, yeah, it's about for you to really think you, you fit for what you want to be doing. I'm going to move to the next slide so I can have some text, but if I want to come back to the slide, we can. Um, I was just putting that in the graphic and thinking about um, perhaps there's a sweet spot in just doing these candidate replacements um, here, and I've got a, um, the next comment's going to be based on that rather than doing the full 600. So just to summarise that table, more tests is more benefit, but reduced return on investment. It's definitely the benefit for your RAM buyer, not just you, so whether or not you can sell those RAMs for more money to that buyer. The RAM breeder mirror is typically, so if we're thinking about doing those candidate replacements around that 212 RAMs that are either going to be sold or, or used for yourself, you can um, be increasing your merit by about 21 cents per year on maternal work, and it's equated to about a 10 to 15 percent increase on genetic gain. So how does that sound? Going twice as fast? Uh, yes, okay, I'll repeat the question for you. But So you were saying that some years ago, um, Zoetis were talking about those that are doing genomics will be going twice as fast or doing 50% uh, faster genetic gain than, um, their than those not doing it. I think the difference there will, and Ashley might voice up and tell me, but I think the difference will be there. We're talking about one test in one year, not continued testing. So if you keep continuing testing, these values are going to increase. And whether or not Michael wants to make a comment there would be great. You're welcome. Yeah, no, it, it depends very much on the scenario because yeah, I've, I've picked one scenario here and it's basically a, um, a, uh, a test of the um, RAM lambs at 2 tubes and that, but there's, you know, a hundred different selections you can choose and I don't know what the assumptions were that were used in that value proposition, but, you know, and there, there's, there's no one value proposition we can do do for this, so it depends a lot on the assumptions and when you're going to test your rams and at what age, etc. Yeah. So it might also be thinking about younger rams. Yeah. So if you're testing every year, Michael? So generally it's cumulative, so, so I think in the scenario that I've given, you know, with a, where uh, Annie's got the pictures of the actual animals, so basically testing about 20% of those 212 uh, two tubes, okay. The year on gain for your ewe flock is, we calculated to be about 21 cents per year, and that's about a, a 10 to 15% uh, increase in the rate of genetic gain for a, typ a typical flock. And talking about maternal birth traits, I mean, what has it changed? NZGE mm. uh, for New Zealand maternal worth. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's a modest increase, but you know, um, I mean, if, if you look at it, you're investing, you know, probably under two thousand um, dollars to basically increase your genetic gain by about fifteen or you know, so percent. So, in my mind, it's a, a modest investment um, without much without much work to get a to get a you know a increase in your genetic gain of, of about fifteen percent. Any other questions on that? Cool. Anything from online? No. Cool. Well, thank you. We'll move on. Um, the next topic then will be moving into our, um, the connectedness, Sharon, I think. Oh, hang on, breeding on genotype alone, that's right. I'm going to hand over to David on this one, it's been a wee part of his area. Here you go, Dave, thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, look, we'll, we'll, we, we won't uh, dive into this uh, too deeply, it was more just to Make sure that you're aware that the topics on the horizon will um, definitely send some communications out to ask for your feedback. 
Uh, but, but in short, um, in the old multi-step system, you know, it had some drawbacks and we had to calculate the, the breeding value off the recorded phenotype separate to the breeding value from the genotypes and then combine that or blend those together and making sure that we um, didn't introduce bias. I mean, for Michael and the science team, it was a, a quite a, a complex process to manage and keep it up to date. Um, and the obvious uh, advantage moving forward with single step is now all of that is done in a single step. The, the, the one of the um, um, byproducts though of that old multi-step system was that breeding value that was just calculated from the genotype. And so we no longer have that available to us in the current um, single step system. And so really um, we've had a, a, a number of parties approach us that used to be able to use that, um, that standalone genome um, MBV that was, that was um, uh, based off um, the genotype. Um, and have basically asked, you know, is there something else um, similar to that that we could have? Um, and so we're just at the, at going through the process at the moment of consulting. Um, we, we need to sit down with the labs and understand how it was being used in the past and collect their feedback. Um, but we've had a, other interested parties approach us as well. And so we just, in the roadshow, really just wanted to flag that that, that topic's on the horizon. And I guess just um, while we, we had a, a room full of breeders, was really just polled to see if anyone in the room, any breeders in the room, um, were using those standalone MBVs previously and, um, and a, a, a feeling that the loss of them now that we've moved into single step. Do any of you have any commercial farmers that may have been using those within flock or anything like that? Okay, cool. No, that, that's fine. Look, we'll, um, we'll go about collecting the, the input from industry and, uh, and we will circulate what feedback we've received and you know whether there's any um, you know, potential um, new tool that we can put in, in the breeder toolbox as well. Um, that, that was great, thank you. Uh, so now we've got uh, Sharon on, on connectedness. I will put that one here on a separate presentation. Mm -hmm. A quick stretch if you want. You've been sitting for a moment or two. Nope. Okay, connectedness. So this is this comes up quite regularly in discussions and it's a wee bit loud actually. Um, so just run through some basic principles and there's some more detail at the back. So this is what we do all the time to do this benchmarking between flocks. So we have two flocks. I've been telling the North Islanders that that's their skinny sheep with little lambs on the left, and, and there's our nice south and large ewes with big lambs on the right. Um, but to benchmark them, we need to have a common ram in the same year with progeny in both flocks. We calculate what that correction is. We need to add four kilos to the lambs on the left, and then we can compare them with all the lambs as if they're one group. So that's that's basically the principle. But, but this could be the same principle if this was hoggett, ewes, and mixed age, and two tooth basically the same thing. So um, in connectedness, we use a, we use, ooh, that's a bit, um, so we use a, a three year window for the early recorded traits. So for live weights and, and meats, so the, the animals born 2018, we have a three year window that we look at connectedness over. But for traits such as reproduction, and, and it's adult reproduction, they have to be a two tooth before we can get the first record so you can see, um, so for the, the three year period is a bit later once they become adults for those sorts of traits. So you'll be familiar with the traffic light, so the, the number means the number of connected animals you've got and, and the smaller the number the less connections till you become unconnected and the faces indicate how old those connections are. This is a really useful summary but it can still um, give you a wrong signal. So we can have flocks that are well connected with a three, so you can't, can't see here, but there's a three, two, one, zero, so that's our threshold, a list of flocks up here. And we can have flocks like these two here, which you can see they're really close to the three. So on the traffic light that have a three, they're really, really well connected. But they were connected through a third flock. 
whose connections were ageing, and they suddenly went from a three to a zero, and it came as a nasty surprise. Um, not, not a good one at all. So it's quite good to have an understanding of who and how you're connected to. This is actually the FE graph because it's the readable one. Once you get into the, um, the live weight ones, it, I must admit when you've got you know, 600 flocks down the left hand side, it does get very difficult to read. But um, we, we can help you with that if, if we need to. So Cheryl Ann did some modelling for us because we had some people that put animals into progeny tests or they shared rams in common and then they were very unhappy when they didn't become connected. So Cheryl did some modelling for us and the results were we've got two flocks and no connections at all. So no background connections in place. What does it take to get over that zero line? And basically that's 25 measured progeny. So that means, you know, if you've got 25 measured progeny and half of them are males and you want to be connected for meat, you're going to have to measure the females as well. And not just the female of that ram, uh, you know, a, a, a large proportion of the females so that we have a, a group, a flock mean to separate against. So I told you that the connected win this window is a three-year period. So in this case, we've got our two flocks and anywhere in that three-year period, we've got two sires that are doing the connecting. And you can see that we can get over that zero threshold with it some smaller numbers than 25, but when you add them up, they still come to pretty much 40 to 50 connections. But because they're spread over the two years, there's a number of com combinations um, that can get us over that line. Reproduction. So sometimes I get questions about how can I be connected for survival and growth but I'm not connected for reproduction. And the answer is we, again we need those 25 measurements. So if you, if you retain just a few daughters then you, you, it can take up to three lammings to get those 25 records. One thing I do notice in, in flocks is that a breeder quite often has a particular look about his sheep and you can often pick out the lynx sire progeny because they look a bit different. And we have these sort of unconscious biases where we see sheep which look different and at the smallest um, offence they tend to get pushed out. Whereas what I'm saying to you is if, you, if this is an area that you're struggling with then you need to retain those daughters, get those lambing records and then put them out if you don't like them. Okay, so facial eczema is not so much um, a topic for you but I'm aware we've got a person online so I'll very quickly cover that one. So what did it take to get facial eczema connectedness? So the rules are slightly different here, reflecting it's a very expensive trait. So again, Cheryl did some modelling. And to get connected in one year, we need to have eight progeny of the link sires, which is quite a lot. Mo the, the standard is normally doing four to five progeny. But again, when we consider over a three-year connectedness period, we can actually get over the line with um, fewer progeny per sire. But again, when you add them up, eight and eight is the same as, as four fours. It's still 16 records, so it's, it's pretty much the same. From a data point of view, it's really important that you don't forget to have those good structures in your flock. So remember, you must connect years by using a previous sire. Otherwise, the ram team in one year is completely disconnected from the ram team in another year. Season effects means... One group may perform better than the other, but we don't know whether that's genetic or environment. And again, the same with our, our age groups and our management mob. This can really mess with BVs. I've just recently done a problem solving where the Bureau came to me and said, we've got this animal and it's got a live weight 8 BV of plus 17. And um, we don't believe it. And uh, generally... If <laughs> Generally, if it sounds too good to be true, then, then it normally is. And in that case, did a bit of work. And you know how you have your weaning weight mobs? And then you go on to have live weight six mobs and later mobs. And when you split those mobs up all over the place, you can get quite a big data set and it can start becoming quite fractured because owning animals with exactly the same um, mob combination can be compared directly with each other. Otherwise, we have to do that, you know, using same genetics in each mob to put them back together. And this animal ended up being in a mob all by itself. And so your first step in a BV is to compare the, after you do your corrections, is to compare the animal against the, the group mean. 
but when you're the only animal in the group, what, what are you being compared against? And so that was the issue in that case. Small flocks, some of this connectedness can be a struggle in, in small flocks, particularly some of our small terminal sire flocks. And when you have to commit to a ram from the previous year and you want to use new rams and linked rams, it can get a little bit tight. If you are going to record new lambs, you've got to record a good bulk of them so you can get that average that you're comparing against. The wonderful thing about doing that in your ewe lambs is you get select more accurate BVs and you can get better selection on those ewe lambs, which will increase your rate of genetic gain. So we also have small groups out there that struggle to maintain that connectedness to the main group in NZGE, but they may well be connected to each other and wanting to choose sires off each other or buy animals off each other. So as the administrators, Cheryl and I have access to a couple of extra fi um, files and we can look up for groups and tell you how your group is connected to each other as opposed to how you're connected to the NZGE. So if that's important to you, if you let us know, we can, we can help you with that. And that's where you can go to get these tools. The, the, that horrible big connectedness tree is in there um, under the connectedness graphs, all under the tools in, in the SIL website. Don't know, do you want to do data quality or you want to move to something else? Connected us first. Yeah. We discussed it on the phone, but if um, Alan and um, Andrew and myself had 25 lambs in the same each flock, and we DNA tested, got predictions for reproduction so well, rah, 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 does that change or improve our connectedness? So if we have the recorded, Cheryl, feel free to jump in if you like, but. Um, Connectedness is based on pedigree at the moment, so we'd have the sire and dam of those lambs recorded normally, so that is what connectedness is based on. We, at this stage, we don't have genomic um, or connectedness. So, so the, so genom the, so the, so the gen genomic work wouldn't improve my connectedness, so the actual measurements no. would be the, the, in the pedigree? Yeah, yeah, but the genomics would improve the accuracy of the BVs on those animals, but it doesn't actually do, the connectedness is based on the fact we've got sires and dams and progeny of common animals and that's irrespective for the um, genotype. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so th th there are always pluses and um, upsides and downsides of all technologies and so one of the upsides of DNA is accurate parentage and um, but one of the downsides can be it can be hard to get accurate date of births, and that that can be one of the things we cover in here. So this is a, a, a case of what I do quite a lot. We call it hero to zero, and um, this is our amazing young animal, and he he can fly. He's powerful and he's smart because he wears glasses. So you know this stuff. This is where you know phenotype is what we measure, and it's the interaction. And we spend all our time in the computer trying to work out what is the genetic component by accounting for the for the um, management and environment effects. So this is some examples of how it can go wrong. I won't cover that because I did in the last talk. But having those basic structures in place is really, really important to having good estimates of merit. So this is a, a, a group of of flocks. I looked at and I, I went through them and I just found some examples. So this here, all the animals have one date of birth. So they were all born on the 9th of September. So I hope that wasn't this year, but hopefully it was a better year than this year. This is another one, but that they had a w one really good day. And here's um, some other numbers. And, and here we have some other numbers here. So whether these are from shedding out or, or whether they're from fetal ageing, I, I don't know. This is just the numbers I have to work with. So when we've done some, some work, we looked at what is the impact of not having good date of birth data. Some of you may have seen this before. So we had a very large flock and we calculated the BVs with they were all tagged at birth and this was some BVs. And we went through them and we took out all the date of births but we, we, we grouped the animals by when they were born, just so that we could track them. So no date of births on this side, and these are the BVs that were generated. So if we look at our animal with it, who was three kilos, which is about the New Zealand average, 
He could be anything from about 2 to plus 5 for weaning weight BV. And you can see these black ones are the early born, so they're bigger. And then we go right through the stages till we get down to the orange triangles, which were the last born. So without date of birth corrections of um, a reasonable calibre, that we, we can end up with quite big overestimates. And weaning weight is used in a lot of traits, not just, um, not just growth. And these, these effects will last through to live weight six and eight. We then took those informations and we said, well, what if we fetal aged or we used crayons or all those sorts of skills at our farmer's disposal and we could group them into 10 day intervals. What does this do? And you can see that we've taken out a lot of the bias, not all of it. Our three kg can be about 2.8 to about three and a half, but he's kind of in the right zone. So if we can get the birth dates into about a, a, a seven to 10 day period, then, then we can um, improve that prediction quite a bit. Another thing I looked at was, this is another group of flocks. These are North Island flocks, so you guys can say, oh, I don't do that. But um, I looked at the number of animals that were entered in the system, and then I looked at how many of them had a weaning weight. So up here, we're looking at animals that are around 75 to 95%. <coughs> so of all the animals entered, they had a weaning weight. So that's kind of in the zone we'd expect for survival, wouldn't it? So we had quite a group down here at 50 to 70%. So did they just get absolutely whacked on survival, or is this incomplete data? And then we have another small group of flocks down here where owning about 30 to 45% of the animals entered in the system had a weaning weight. Now this is really important. Your foundation stone for good data is complete weaning data because we use that to account for the fact that some animals are culled and don't have a later measurement. So we use that to account for culling. So the foundation is to have complete weaning weights. I then looked at what did they do after that. So this is based on live weight 6, 8, 10, so to see whether they had a record. And you can see here, I think I had, I think I had, um, oh, was it 56 flocks I looked at, and about a good half of them had no later measurements on the, on the females. They only had a weaning weight on the females. Some of them didn't have a didn't have a live weight six or eight on the males either, and some of these were the same flocks. So basically, live weight six or live weight eight is all being predicted from weaning weight and, and parent records. Um, quite a few of the flocks had about half of the ewe lambs went on to have an autumn weight, and um, and again in our in our rams, about half of them, about f you know a good. 30 to 50% of the ram lambs got an autumn weight. And then we have some of the, there's a really keen person, nearly all the ewe lambs and all the ram lambs had a live weight six or eight, but that was uncommon. And then we have this one here, who was the same person who only had 30% of the animals that had a weaning weight. So we had 200 mixed sex weaning weights, and now we've got 400 live weight sixes on males only. So that means there was about 800 animals at least in total. So, yeah, go figure. <laughs> so what happens when we don't have um, those U weights? So basically the system says if I don't have much information to calculate the BV, I will shrink it towards the mean. It's being informed by her half-brothers and sisters, but they're all going to get kind of an average value. So it means your discrimination on the U lamb side of things is less, and so the BVs are less, so your indexes are lower. And, um, you know, when they become parents and you get the mid-parent mean, then, again, those numbers will be lower. So less accurate BVs, less accurate decisions, reduced <laughs> progress. So we're talking about the value proposition of genomics before. But for some people, there's an awful lot of gain they can make with, with better recording in their flocks. So management mobs. Um, this is a, an example we've recently done. So this, this data came in and... The bureaus get a, a red flag on a date when, when there's multiple dates and one recording mob, a red flag comes up. So in this one, um, I looked at this, it still looks for this first. If there's more than one mob, it then goes and looks for the date. But if this says it's one mob, it doesn't go looking for the date. It does prioritises this first. 
So you, I looked at this and I said, does that look like a two-humped camel? And we've got a huge variation from under 15 kilos to 45. So you look at this animal, um, if, if the first thing we do is, you know, the deviation from the mean, he's plus 15 kilos. He's going to get a huge BV. This guy here is minus 15 kilos on the average. He's going to get a shocking BV. Okay, so what if I graph it by the three recording dates? And this is what it looked like after that. And you can see this group here now have an average of about 22 kilos. This group are close to the 30. And this group up here are somewhere around that 30 seven mark. And so now at 45, he's only seven kgs above his flock average. So he's no longer going to get this whacking great BV. So we would look for progeny in common between these mobs, work out the correction, and basically would slide all those graphs on top of each other after the correction animals would be given the appropriate BV. So you can see that mob coding um, can have a huge impact on those BVs and can make them unreliable if not done well. So you can get a variety of audit reports from your bureaus that will give you your across year lengths and age groups and survivals and you can get some flock statistics on the data added. That can be a nice summary to make sure what you thought's gone in has gone in and um, they can give you some feedback. And so, you know, at the end of the day, hero or zero, um, most of the ones I look into, that's what I'm doing, looking into why he was good. They used him and now his data comes back and it's, and it's been a huge disappointment. So, yep, that's my talk. Any questions? Hang on, I'll just keep, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. I mean... They're not going to tell you what they're not doing. Or what yeah, so doing. I think we're on a wee bit of a track um, in BLG. So we've had the best practice guide come out. We're getting Improve. Improve is going to be a lot smarter, I think, in what it can do. So that graph on the mobs, I'm hoping as part of our automatic checks that, that the bureaus will see and those things, that it will do some of these things and say, hey, this looks like it should be, and more things will come up. And as we progress that, I think we would like to move to a, a place where we have sort of like a data quality score or grade. And so it may, it may I think you always have to have a really strong education program first, but, it, but this is what I'm thinking about going forward is you could have a, a, just a simple graphic that shows number of animals added, number of weaning weights, number of ram and ewe lamb live weight sixes, number of ram, um, you know, number of you wait, and it could just be a graph with those bars, and you can just show it and go, there, that's what I've done. And you'd, it would be quite visual, and you'd very much see some of those cases where, you know, <coughs> still predicts all the breeding values. You don't actually even have, have to record anything, and you'll get a full set of BVs, but you're only kidding yourself. Yep. Someone else is kidding Yeah. So, Sharon, why, why can't we have an accuracy percent? That would cover all those things where you've got yeah, we, we, suspect. we already have accuracy percents. Um, it's, accuracy is a bit of a funny thing in that it's not quite what people think all the time. It's, it's about how much data informed it. So when you think about things like ultrasound, it doesn't say it's a very accurate measure, but, but it says how many records have we got. And with things like live weights where a live weight at one time is quite strongly correlated with live weights at other times, you can actually have quite high accuracies even when the recording might not be what you might think it is. So we probably have discouraged people recording accuracies because the system shrinks the BVs and we didn't want people to double count. But I think there are some, sometimes there are some good cases when having the accuracy is important, particularly perhaps on um, health traits, particularly facial eczema. Anything you wanted to add, Cheryl? Nope. <laughs> I must be doing okay. My other question is, uh, look, we don't do the genomic measurements, but what you said there about um, if you haven't got a birth date, does that call into account the accuracy of those genomic measurements if you haven't got an accurate birth date for those animals? Um, yeah, so the, the I've showed that the birth date is reasonably robust. If we can get it within sort of a a seven to ten day period, 
it's reasonably robust. Um, and there's a number of things people can do to fine tune that, you know, fetal ageing and then you might do some sh shedding out or, or whatever, it depends what's practical on your farm. But yeah, all, all these things have pluses and minuses. So with the DNA you get some very accurate records. Survival, we have a whole litter, you know, we have two lambs to a ewe from a preg scan, one dies um, and we have one live lamb, so she gets one live lamb. We assume that the dead lamb is by the same sire and 95% and of the time that's correct. But if we have a ewe that loses both lambs, who are they by? We don't know. Um, so you get, I every technology has its strengths and weaknesses, but probably the point I was making in my talk is doing the basics right can really improve your accuracy and then if you want to layer genomics on top, make sure it's on the good foundation here. Who's, who's you should be in the uh, New Zealand All Blacks, I think, uh, Alan, <laughs> then I'll pass like that. Um, so the biggest danger really is inaccurate information. So if there's yeah. no date and it's assumed everything's there, it's predicting. Where, where there's no records of things, the, um, you know, the, ac the not the accuracy, but the overall index is reduced, which you would think is common sense. So why are we still, why have we still got breeders and that that aren't up to, up to speed. You'd be surprised who some of them are, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't just assume it's, you know, don't just assume it's, it's someone over there. It can, it can be anyone. Some of it is just poor understanding. Some of it, um, you know, I had one where there were no birth dates at all, but then I found out his house burnt down. Um, and that's why one year out of the many he didn't have. But but it, it can be surprising. On, on the question of that, if, if you didn't have a birth date, could you, uh, were, you know, the only other option is between the weaning weight and the autumn weight. For someone who did that, you get the growth rates from there. Yeah, some people, so you know, know make an assessment. Would that even be possible for those sort of people to do that? Some people make an assessment at tailing, you know, uh, or maybe they shed out and they give a, I know that these ewes went into this paddock on this day and um, I shed out on that day so I can give all those lambs this average birth date. So there, there's a number of ways you can do it. But uh, all I'm saying is, uh, you know, you, if it's not done reasonably well, then it can, it can lead to disappointment when animals have big BVs and you use them and it doesn't, it's not genetic. Yeah. The other thing I didn't say is, you know, sometimes there's stuff that we don't know about. So if people have lambed hoggets and they haven't entered that in the system, we can't do any checks on data that's not there. But uh, I'm, I'm sort of leaning now towards, you know, a wee feedback graph of what you put in and what, and, you know, and, and start with that to try and encourage people to lift their recording standards. But we better keep moving, otherwise we'll be here all night. Yeah. Thank you. That's cool. Should we have a wee stand up and, as we change over speaker? Stand up, get, uh, get a bit of thing in and we'll be on to the next topic. And then we'll do old oh, fish weeks first. Oh, that's quite a quick one. I wondered if, if I ran that guy, there's only more one guy online. Okay. I wondered if I sure. bring him and set up a site called Assault and Sue him. Cool. I don't know that there are any places. Methane, yeah. Well, I was thinking about this one, but Sharon's just talking me out of it. I wonder if there's only the one guy online, so I could do a site call and run it yep. through the Yeah. Or use the internet. Yep. And then, well, how about we do the wool quality and meat quality? And then. Um, and we can discuss this if those that want it don't want to leave. We've done this already. So that's out. Yeah. Do you want me to just jump around? And yeah, we'll jump around. It's fine. I'll share it up on methane. Yeah, methane does go to the quality. 
Okay, cool. Alrighty. And we're going time wise. Am I on? Okay, dog. <laughs> what do you think, guys, about coming back in? <laughs> Should we get back? Are we ready to come back in? Are you? <laughs> you bumped them. No worries. Okay, guys, I'll get back into the methane one to get it out of the way. You can do it standing up if you like. I know, it's, I know this one's a, it's, it's keen for some people and not so for others, so I'll just get through it relatively quickly, but doing it justice, okay? Right. Okay, online there, Dave, too? Sweet. Okay, so just reflecting on... Oh, I've got my glasses on. I don't need that now. Nice and big. Um, just reflecting on you know, a bit of the framework about why we're trying to do something in agriculture, considering that's this 48% contribution out here. Just that framework. Um, debated if we want to, but you know, just reflecting on that. Um, we can do something about breeding for low methane. And this is a module we've put, uh, just been putting in now. So um, the unit is a yield of gra grams of methane per day. It's moderately heritable, which means we can do something about it. It's also got some variation, which means we've got some room for some selection. And then the selection lines at AgriSearch um, for low methane, they've found no detrimental correlation. So when they've been selecting for um, low methane as a single straight trait, they found no um, bad things that come with it. The group of the, when they did the original selection of the high and low, like the top 10 and the bottom 10%, they found that they were 4% different in their methane emission. <coughs> After um, selection, they've now got 11% difference. So they've made some progress in a single trait selection for that. The ones that have low methane tend to be leaner, tend to have a bit more wool, and a higher index of Nutella maternal worth, and with including facial eczema in that one. Uh, not facial eczema, F is for worm fig, sorry, correction. The... Um, the methane module that we're looking to roll out with AgriSearch and, and PGDRC is that it's, it's live now. We'll be providing research breeding values delivered through the single step based on the pack chamber measurements. We found when uh, AgriSearch advised us we need 2,500 animals assessed annually to maintain the prediction. So we want to support that and have a preference for the genotype maternal animals. It's an expensive trait to do, a complicated trait to do, so we want to be able to leverage genomics into it to be able to spread it to more animals um, to get its value. It doesn't mean you, if you're not doing genotypes you can't do it, you can, but we've just got that preference there. Um, it requires two measurements, 14 days apart, and the trailer that comes around, it can, uh, we want to do, can do 84 animals a day and looking for 8 to 10 progeny per sire. And uh, the early indication is about 60 bucks per animal for a pack uh, assessment. So that's beginning the two measurements. So $30 each measurement, so $60 for an animal to be assessed. Um, just have a wee look at the trailer that's been um, made by Ag Research going around. It's got to fit inside your shed to be out of the um, shade and also not knock the head off the um, technician that has to get up in there as well. The sheep get loaded in, pretty uh, simple system there with the prat leaves. And this is a look of the sheep that are in that chamber if you haven't seen it um, before. If you're interested, who do you contact? So the pack measures are being performed by Ag Research. The data will be entered into um, Improve or, or SIL and we'll be helping with that at the early stages. The research breeding values will be reported by your bureau and come through the Improve SIL system. If you want to register your interest in this, there is a form that's been created. We've got that link, um, Dave, we'll probably be sending it out post-roadshow 
Good yeah, on. yeah. On the next slide, you'll get a preview of, of what it's go going to look like. But we'll make sure there's a section on sill with a FAQ and a link to that form. We've got one trailer and one technician, so we need to be coordinating um, that with the North Island and South Island where it's available. So um, really want to have that registration process and also making sure it fits um, with what your outcome that you want with um, what's going to be loaded in. Um, the and there is a fixed facilities here at Woodland, so you guys have another opportunity, something a wee bit lo more local. You can expect an opportunity in spring and autumn to be measuring sheep, but um, yeah, only those that are registered on the form can do it, and it will be um, something like this. I'm just recognising all those parties involved in that. Okay, so that was methane. Not too hard. Question gone up. Thank you. Hi, Annie. Can you tell us what the research BVs are called? That they're already available for us to report for those breeders who have already done so this. Just live, testing. It's just live right now, so I'm going to look to the person just behind you with Cheryl Land. What's the um, the name of the breeding value, the research, what's, what are you, the name you just? Pack methane and pack CO2. Pack methane and pack CO2. Perfect. And the, the bureaus will be sent out a note explaining them any day because we're doing the testing at the moment. Michael's running a test job as we speak. Yeah. Cool. So it's really live and fresh. All right. Any other questions on? Uh, yep, a couple more. What was that relationship with FEC? Was that positive or negative? It's positive. Um, it might be a founder effect, though. We don't know if it's if it's truly going to be correlated. We need to see it in that. Um, you know, as it goes out to industry. Was it yeah. Index? yeah, it was in the index. Yeah. Well, then, sorry. Then, in on hard feeds, that differential was actually a lot higher. It was thirty percent on hard feeds. Ah, oh, the, the um, high heritability. Low yep. So this is the heritability that's been reported to me with the module, the way we've done it, um, and it's, this is a trailer method that's using grass feed, um, to, you know, you, you, having the grass feed animals going into that trailer, so that's the heritability we're using with this yep. module. Okay. Uh, um, the animals that have been through the progeny test will have this already, is that correct? Yep, we've been measuring it in the hub CPT, we're also measuring it at the low input site, it's been an important trait for that um, low input progeny test as well. So a lot of people will be able to see animals that are related in their flocks with measures already? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so it should be coming through, yeah. Remember it'll be passed through by that genomic relationship. Okay, cool, thank you. Next topic we decided on from the board, um, there was talk about wool quality and, and meat quality, so she'll, I think wool is the next slide anyway. Sharon, do you want to deal with that one? I'll hang by for meat quality next. So, there's only, is it going? Yep. There's only a couple of slides here, wool quality. So, we're seeing two things happening in SIL at the moment. We're having a, a, an increase in Wiltshire and shedding flocks. I think we've had 10 new Wiltshire flocks come in. But we also have some crossbred people that are trying to breed finer. So what we currently had was we had a, um, a diagonal slope for our Corridale and Mid-Micron people where as you got finer the wool was worth more and for our crossbred people it was just a flat line. So um, 40 micron wool was, was valued the same as 35. It was just if you had more of it then you got a higher DPW. Yeah, so this was done a, a year ago and the prices have, have changed a little bit. So we can see that there, the, the, the bars are showing the historical data that Abacus collected. So you can see that, that there is quite a lot of variation, but the general trend is finer is higher value. And in the, in the crossbred stuff, there is, there is some value here in that 31 to 35 the line is changing. It's no longer just the straight flat because it, it's going into some knitwear products. Um, so what we're proposing is, is that we will have a non-linear index the same as we have with capped reproduction. So um, all, all our Corridale people and yourselves that are measuring fine wool and are wanting to go finer will, will get an index where as you move up this the reward will get greater. So that it, it <coughs> would be a lot more sensitive. We've got some flocks in the North Island where they're doing a thousand um, fibre diameter samples a year on ram hoggets and have been doing for some time. So there are some people that are certainly wanting this and, and we also have been asking people the question is wool still a core part of maternal worth and 
half the breeders say yes and the other half say no. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure we go with that. So this is just a little thing showing the relationship between fleece weight, so clean fleece weight along here and fibre diameter along here. And you can see it's not a very strong relationship, but generally as we get heavier, we do get um, stronger microns. So basically, we're looking for these, these animals that have good high fleece weight and um, for, for our mid-micron people that have high fleece weight and, and good microns. And they will get a reward and it's additive to the DPW. And so everyone can be in the same evaluation and the same indexes. So it'll be quite an improvement. Colour score is the other part of wool quality that's important. The bulk and all those things, those market signals have certainly fallen away and aren't there at the moment. So the Australians measure it with a colour score. This is their system on the, on the right. And um, I think we would just adopt the same system because we do these trans-Tasman analysis and you may as well be consistent. Um, and there was some, some price information from Abacus about the effect of price on colour. So a colour test is $6 per sample, so I think we're going with a scoring system. <laughs> I can't see anyone spending $6. To get the thing. So that's that's that. Meat quality is next. Any oh, questions? Yeah. Will we change it? Yeah. Yeah, Sharon, in the current mid micron wool quality index, there's yeah. a whole lot of other characteristics yeah. that yeah. people who are measuring fibre diameter are also measuring. So are they no longer going to be in the wool quality index? Yeah, so um, we went through that. There's some quite limited information and there's some information that is recorded but isn't used in the module either. So at the moment, um, in the recent past, the only clear market signals are on diameter and colour and things like curvature and staple length and strength, which do have a heritable component, uh, are not really adding any value. So kind of streamlining the module. You don't okay, look happy. So, uh, <laughs> no, it just seems a waste of information if it's there and it's not being used. Hang on, hold I haven't finished. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> One more question. When is this going to get implemented? Um, so it, it was prioritised behind methane. So Cheryl's got, um, they just about got methane over the line and she's been re-estimating the genetic parameters on wool. So the, it would be nice if we got it before Christmas, but it may be that it'll be February if we don't quite make that line. But you can record the trait, you know, you can do your fibre diameters, you can do your colour scores and, and it'll, they'll be used as soon as it's up and running. Yeah, I, I think um, comfort factor and uh, coefficient of variation of the fibre within the staple, those are huge traits that for us to be able to market wool into, into apparel manufacturers, they're, they're crucial because it's no good having 30, yeah. you know, 30 mi you know, we'll say 25 micron wool and then having 40 micron yeah. fibres in it and having an after of, say, 28. Because it's not 28, it's going to feel like a 40. Yeah, so we have looked at what, what the data is in the system and we've been going through some of the data and ringing people and just checking what it is and, and those things are probably still under consideration but um, we want a good argument to include them, really. So when you look at what the Corridor people are actually putting into the system, there's very little of that information actually coming in. Well, I yeah. think this needs to be quite market-led. Yeah. There's yeah. more information coming all the time. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll take, we'll take that on board. Yep. Thanks for that. Well, the, 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 there's a huge opportunity between $15 and $2. Is yeah. it $2 increased wool? Uh, kilos of wool is actually a big negative on the overall worth of of the value of that sheep. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll we'll take that on board and we'll. I'm going to just hang on a bit, Sharon, because you'll be up next again, and I'll take this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's change over as quick. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, so meat quality was up next on our board. Um, so only got a wee few slides here, so it'll be short and sweet. Um. So the meat quality work that we've got is, is coming out of that Farm IQ program, like the South Island Genomic Calibration um, work. 
And um, I mean, it's old data now from that Farm IQ, but just that, although it's a pretty rough relationship, there's a little bit of that tendency as we're increasing the terminal, sorry, overall, which is about the terminal worth, um, as that was increasing, there was a um, subtle drop in, this, uh, in the, te in the uh, meat quality, which was a bit concerning. So um, it's, it's not, you know, it's rough, it's not absolute, but there is that little bit of tendency there. Um, so with the meat quality, this is, the, this is what we're rele um, releasing with that South Island Genomic Calibration Group, that if you're participating in that site, um, Michael tells me we've got about 65,000 genotypes now in the October run. The indexes that come out are the tenderness, meat pH, colour stability, and marble score. Oh, I think that's diligently measured at Ag Research. The Wendy's at the back of the room, probably part of that. Um, it's measured at the site, or at Silver Firm Farm, or in that lab, um, and it's delivered by genomic relationships. So you, in this um, site, you don't have to have the same RAM used at home, it's having some relatives used at home, because it's that relying on the genomic prediction of those traits. So um, for now, it's with those that are participating at the um, SIGC, and it's, um, it's because it's a partnership, it's a Farm IQ program that we've joined in later. Um, so it's not something that we as BLG run, but we do support. Uh, but we do want to see meat quality integration into the NZGE, and it's yet to be completed, where we go yet with that. So um, I welcome feedback and input on what we should be doing on that. Just um, one thing that's come any, up. With any yeah. questions? Oh, sure. Question, just um, that last point. So if, is it going to happen, and when is it going to happen? So there's a bit of work that needs to be done about making sure that the, uh, the way we'd be measuring meat quality, and it's probably IMF really is the one that's been more commonly measured with other sites, uh, bringing it together to a gold standard so it can actually be, um, you know, um, calibrated against what's been measured here at this site. So I believe, when do you know, the, the marble score has the, uh, the gold standard being the chemical um, test, the, fact, the chemistry, wet chemistry test. I'm not sure if that's been done at that site. I thought it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, so no, it's been the visual. It's been a visual at the moment, yeah. Okay, so, um, so there's a bit of work to do to make sure that that can be calibrated. Uh, there is some discussion, um, we, we sort of need to have that discussion. We had a whiteboard session with Ag Research probably about could be 10 months ago, maybe eight months ago, and just feel like we need to make that next progress. So it's on our list to keep addressing. I haven't got the solution yet, Andrew, but um, yeah. And um, it's also about, um, there was a talk about national breeding objectives. Does this fit into it? I think it still does, um, even though you're not getting rewarded on it. It's anticipating what the, um, the industry needs, and it's, it's probably a beef and lamb thing about it fitting with our taste, pure nature, making sure that our meat is of that higher standard that we, we claim it is. So, yeah. Um, so sorry, I don't know if that's entirely satisfying. I haven't got the answer, but it's coming. It's still on our list. Here's another question. What you could do. H hang on, please? another question. Yes, sorry, Peter. Yes, and Annie, I think. The, the the major thing I think you want to be aware of in meat quality and what's showing up in, in the work they're doing is that we can get our lambs too, too lean. And, yeah. and, and, and uh, the, the UK are awake to that and they don't keep on giving brownie points to animals that are super lean. Yeah. And, and they, they bend their credentials that way. And that's the, 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 the biggest challenge we've got, that yep. we've got an end of our lambs now that are too lean. Yeah. And that's going to affect their marbling and other traits and make them less eating quality. So that's, that's what we're um, looking for, that, that uh, indication, but we are still getting a penalty for from coming through from the processor for those lambs that are going over fat, so that's why it's still represented in there. We definitely have taken the penalty off the maternal animals for fat, uh, but it is still here in the terminal side from the economic... Um, you know, the evaluations that we've done that it still needed to be in there, but I, I understand this is a question we keep raising. But if you do, at the moment, want to do, do if you're worried about you or your client's um, lambs going too lean, you can have a look at that selection, uh, breaking down the, the meat yield here into its lean component and its fat component now, and have a look about um, selecting animals that might be a bit fatter, so that you're not, you yourself are um, having a little bit less selection on, on that fat penalty. So if you think about these two rams here, um, they've got the same meat index, TSM, about you know, 340 points, but they're getting it from different ways. Which one of these would be the fatter one? Just asking, because remember we've got a penalty on fat, so it would be the smaller number 
would be the fatter animal. So ram B, if you were worried about going too lean and you wanted to bring that fat back into your system, even with the current index, you could start selecting these types of <coughs> animals that have a, um, a higher fat component in their TSM than the, than the leaner ones. They've bent the curve of the fertility, yep. There's no reason why you couldn't bend the curve so that no. those extra lean animals didn't keep carry on getting extra uh, um, index points. It's a good point for us to take on board, and it, yeah, we'll have that um, conversation with the scientists too. Another question? Yep. Actually, that was my question, but I also have another one. Okay. I've just heard from some terminal sire breeders that their ewes, uh, uh, ram, sorry, are getting too big. Yep. So I'm just wondering if there's any consideration about putting adult weight in the terminal sire index. That's the first time it's come up to, to, to me, so that's uh, interesting. Have you heard anything about that before, Sharon? Uh, it's quite an interesting concept because when I'm a commercial farmer, I use these terminal sire rams, I want to, everything gets killed at six months, I never have to deal with adults, I want them to grow fast and be meaty. But when you're the actual terminal sire breeder, um, Yes, you've got fewer traits to select on. You can make greater progress. You can get quite big animals. They can be quite hard to handle. Um, and, and also, the other one that some terminal sire breeders report is reproduction because you know they can they want to have a decent number of animals to select from. So reproduction is not at all of interest to me as a commercial farmer, but the re the, the breeder may want a good number. So um, it's not something that's been raised before, but. Uh, Everything we've got is about going forward, and which means bigger weights. And as soon as you've got bigger weights, you're going to get bigger adults, and there's only one way it's going. Um, so if they were recording that, they could select it up within their own block, wouldn't they? Like yes, if they, if they wanted to, it's just a matter of recording it, and they can report it. Um, but it, it is, yeah. Hmm, interesting one. Any more questions on this, this one? Okay, thank you. Um, well, we are at six, but we would still like to carry on. Yep. Feel free to step up and walk out if it's, it's past your thing. We won't find it rude. But um, how about we have uh, talk about the visual scores next, Sharon? Well, can you pass me that um, booklet around? I've got to find a pocket. Yeah. Um, where's visual scores? Um, uh, yeah, sorry, Dave might help us. Yeah, there we one? go. No, there it is. So this is very much a work in progress and, and no firm decisions have been made, but we have to have a visual score resource to go with the wool quality, so they need a they need a chart to do the colour scores against. So the one shall you couldn't pass me that. So this blue one that we did for dairy is the sort of resource we were thinking of where you have all your words at the top, we have a sketch and we have some pictures and it's plasticky paper so you can have it in the yards without it turning to mush on you. The, one, the other one is the Australian version that's going around. Um, so there's a few visual scores we already have so we just pop them in but we have some unfortunate history in that we have a, a DAG score that goes from 0 to 5 and then with 5 being bad and then, then we have bare bottoms with 5 being good and it's a 1 to 5 score, bellies with 5 being bare. So we haven't got the we haven't set up from scratch like the Australians where everything is one to five and the good ends always the same. But there's some discussion about do we need some extra traits and there are already a whole lot of scores in SIL and some of them do have quite a few records and some don't. So shedding is one thing. We have a malt score, so you can do zero to a hundred percent malting, or we can have a, a scoring system. There's a very standard foot rot score. Um, foot, leg and um, jaws, that kind of constitution. So far in my discussions at Forum and on these roadshows, half the farmers go, yes, we need this, and the other half go, no, that's our business, stay out of it. Um, and we also know that, you know, the young farmer stock judging is not kind of around like it used to be, and, and perhaps we are having a, a generation change. So there's a few few things that could be there. So. This is just my working draft, so this is some work on, on a shedding score. 
and this is some work on legs, which may be of more interest to you. So this is past an angle, and you, I, I, there's no decision about whether one's good or bad, but these ones at this end have very, very angled pastons, and this one here is a, a, a nice pastons. But then there's another score, which I didn't quite know how to handle, which is when the legs are over straight. Um, you see that in a lot of the cattle visual scores. I, I have to think about things from, if we were to ever have a BV, that intermediate optimum is a very hard thing to, to go by. It's easier if we're always trying to go to one end of the scale. Um, if it's just a straight score, then it's no trouble that we have, you know, one is too low, three is perfect, and five is too straight. That's not a problem. But it is difficult if it was ever going to be a BV. So some of those things. And this is about the, the hooves. So we have these little crossover scissor ones here through to a nice set of... Um, hooves here. If you look at the cattle, they go into how wide the hooves are and, and get into quite a lot of detail. Um, I don't know, any feedback on this is, is most welcome. And then, you know, jaws, we, some breeders are telling me you need a good wide jaw, others are owning undershot, overshot, so you get quite a few things. You know, how deep do we go into this, really? So you're welcome to give me any feedback you like on the resources that we may have planned and versus Australia or whatever. And I know many of you have your own systems. Um, some of the other scores, you know, the teeth angle, what's desired for dairy is one end and what's desired for lambs is the other end. We could actually use the same resource, just we've got different groups going for different ends of it. So yeah, that, that, that's my talk, so feel free yeah, to have wait a question. In. Chair, and I understand the problem with one to five. I've just used it. Five is the bigger number, so therefore it's better. It's the same as scoring a try. Um, one is the worst, and I see we've got some each way in yeah. what you've already shown us, and I know you've done that, so um, I don't know. So we, yeah. we considered five the best, so that's my 40 yep. cents worth. Yep, no, that's good. Well, my view, Sharon, is that the uh, you're getting unduly complicated with your recording if you try to get in the type. And I think that's the breeder's job and the buyer's job. Either an animal is a good animal on the records and he's a sufficient physical standard or he's not. And it, if he's not a sufficient physical standard, the breeder should have got rid of him. And, and I think you're just getting too complicated. Yeah, so we have the ones we need, like the dag scores and the bellies, but yes, you, you're saying keep out of sort of what would you call it, confirmation? Yes, yes, I agree, and I wouldn't be going to put it into a BV. I think it's for breeder use, and, and if he wishes to record it, that's that's for his culling and bits and pieces. It's easy enough to get a sire summary, uh, include those if he's really keen, but I would be keeping right out of that sort of thing. Because another you know, option is, you know, if we collect scores on the progeny of these animals, you know, instead of going to a BV, can we just say have an average score? For his progeny, so it's not a BV, but you know you might have a, a sire that averages. Say if we said five was good for pastons, he might have a a paston score average of four and a half, and another one might have a three. There's when I talk around, you know, you're both, with all due respect, the older generation with probably more experience in these areas, and and we do get people wanting some guidance at at the younger end of things, so. Yeah, we, we, you know, maybe in improve we don't have to do BVs, maybe we can just do an average score, um, those sorts of things, there's other things we can do, or, or not do it at all. But there are some scores we have to have because they're part of our system. Yeah. Julia, you're looking a bit sceptical. I was just thinking that there's a lot for breeders to record already, mm. and should we not just limit it to the things that you can't see so that you have to have a breeding value for and these sorts of things you can easily see and surely we have to leave some of it up to breeder stockmanship because otherwise mm. we're just doing it all off the paper then what's the fun in that and also <laughs> I mean 
not uh, pipe anymore, Julia. <laughs> of course, the exception, all the people in the room are, are doing their records impeccably, but there are plenty of people out there who are not. So perhaps that's where the focus should be, is on, on improving the data quality for the traits that are important mm. and that you can't see, rather than the ones that you can clearly see. So all in favour, stick your hand up. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, avoiding going into this space. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> there's just a wee comment that came in from online is that they disagreed with the comments because that there are too many RAMs that are being used and then pack up later, like they're actually being sold. And so they, this person online felt that an EBV would really help um, with some of that issue. So I guess we're a bit polarised, although this room's pretty Yeah, unanimous. I get 50-50 wherever I go, generally. Yeah, so to get to a BV stage, we need heritabilities and genetic parameters, and we need a reasonable data set on which to do it. So there certainly wouldn't be BVs <laughs> in the short term, but we need to think about if we set it, the scoring system up, that it may allow that in future if desired. The sheep today looks a lot different to the sheep of 50 years ago, and the sheep in 50 years' time is going to look a hell of a lot different to the sheep today. So mm. I just think you start scoring. Um, well, I think it comes down to the buyers just saying, nah, that ram's not up to it. And, mm. Or your ram's broken down. That might be a good one for the guy online. If ram's broke down, buddy, tell the breeder and yeah. get, a, get a refund. So I think we, we have a demand for this <coughs> one, um, for shedding, and I think some of the low input people have got almost a demand for the opposite. They want bare point sheep, but they want to retain as much fleece as possible. Whereas with shedding, you actually have to have the shedding gene. Um, Just a couple more comments, Sharon. As far as the structure goes, I don't think you should have it at all. I don't even think you should have the option to have it. Be hmm. Farmers on looking, doing the improving, going zinc zinc, I want great feet. And you're going to get some breeder who's just going to mark everything as a five. And so he's only going to be, you know, I mean, anything under a three should be culled or, or anything under a four should be culled anyway. But you just, yeah. Yeah, you so we, we also have some first. some flocks that do want a standardised recording system. So that 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 can be optional, that if someone wants to, has identified that they have an issue and, and go, they can ask us for a resource and we can give them a resource that says, here is a standardised scoring system that you can use. And um, that's kind of where those things have come from. Yeah, that's um, right, but not yeah. But not necessarily have to put in into sill. Yep. Oh, you just kind of answer my question about the, the, the sort of for the you know people like me that are quite younger and coming through to have something available, yeah. you know, where I can learn from and select my animals from, um, you know, what the standards are and stuff. Because you know, like a I'd rather than having to invent it for yourself. Yeah, like good, I can see. Good call. Thank you. Yeah what other people are doing. Thank you. Yep, no, that, that's all good. So, I mean, I'd be more than happy not to have to do too much in this space, but maybe if someone does want a standardised scoring system, then we can have a resource if they, if they want it. As most people will probably take something and adapt it and change it to their needs as well. So that's good. Yep. Well... Um, we might so that's pretty much the um, the topics. The only one was there was a facial expert one, but I think that was for someone online. So yeah, we might follow I'll up that person. That um, did you want to discuss the adult size and body condition score, or we'll just have a keep talking? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, um, the point being, we've actually heard this one before. It's a part of um, not just the thinking of the adult size as one blunt um, uh, weight. You want to think about how um, what the condition of the animal is too. Uh, what can we do around that, Sharon? Are we just? Uh well, this is probably a good one for Cheryl Wien to have some comment. But one of the problems we'd have is um, we've got about 80 flocks recording body condition score, and so when you look at connect, if we made it part of of the DPA, is that what you're asking? If we made it part of DPA, that would cut an awful lot of flocks out of being eligible to be benchmarked for maternal worth or maternal worth plus traits. So. And it's a, a, they'd prob we'd probably have to do some science around that. So at the moment, it, it's an option. Cheryl, did you want to say something? The microphone's behind you. 
Same. Same result. But, yeah. but I, I think, you know, if, if you were, in, in, in the truest sense, that's the logical place for it to be. But um, how long it might take us to get there, and if we get there, might be um, another question. But it would cut a, at this stage, it would cut a lot of people out. Oh, just one more comment from Shirley. We just had a comment um, online also, where someone has suggested that the solution could be a user pay system for these minor traits. It's just something to discuss with the room. Thanks for that. Uh, a question, um, a comment I'd make on the adult size body condition score one is. Um, from a science point of view, we don't entirely know what we want in terms of body condition score profiles. So do you want an animal that is, has its body condition score changes over the year because it mobilises the fat reserves, or do you want something that stays consistent? So I, at the moment, we don't quite have the answer science-wise to say what we're looking for. Oh. <laughs> right of reply. Right of reply. <laughs> It's very hard to generalise when you say that because you're quite right about that. We're, we're only doing body condition score once a year when we do the weight prior to mating. So you, you that's can, our guideline. Yeah. You can record it at multiple times. Um, I, I know you four can, times but we're doing year, enough yeah. already. Yeah, I know. Well, okay, that's, I guess that's a, the wrap up of we've answered those questions that we needed to. Dan, did you just want to have a little something to, to follow up with at the end? There was a. Yeah, well, you just oh. Want a one minute you want a one minute summary? Okay. Right. How fast can I go? Sorry, d sorry Dan. Uh, where do I go? 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 Here we go. Let's see how fast I could do it for you. So I was just reflecting on the fact that um, not many flocks are recording it. Uh, this is just off the uh, young range from October, that there's 24 to 26 flocks recording facial eczema and around 14,000, 14,500 rams, these are young rams, um, being available. You have to think about only the top half of those being uh, any good for facial eczema. Um, that's really not probably enough. Oh. Yep. I could if I could find it, Dave. Yep. Sure. Just having a look. Yeah, down here. So... Around, um, if you're thinking only the top half being any good for facial eczema, it feels like there's only about 7,000 available for industry, which to me sounds not quite enough. Um, just a reminder that the index is a linear index. It's a big penalty on for every GGT that goes up. And whether you're getting your GGT from a natural challenge or any dose rate, it's treated the same. Okay, So it's a GGT value um, that is getting the breeding value with the, um, the index of that applied. Um, Sharon showed earlier an example of the dendrogram talking about we know we've got a problem with connectedness, we've got some flocks up here well connected, there's some uh, connected with each other quite well but dropping out with connectedness and it's a bit of a problem when you're going across breed, across dose and across islands perhaps um, for some. So recognise those problems. Uh, we wanted to talk about your fee so um, it came, it's been coming up at the last road show, it came up um, we decided to follow on with a talk at, in February with the FE breeders that were at Stephen Harris's place in, in February. And out of that, the, the issues that were still bubbling up, we said we need to dig down a bit deeper and have a really in-depth uh, breeder and science conversation. So Russell, James and Hamish um, got together with Cheryl, Sharon, Cheryl Ann and I uh, to dig into these things a bit deeper. Uh, we wanted to resolve, can we get increase the number of FE tolerant flocks in the rams on offer? Because that's something BLG really is, is really trying to focus on doing. And can we factor dose rate into DPX because that's seen as a bit of a block for adopting um, DPX? And how can we facilitate affordable connectedness so that we can get more reliable across lock values uh, to help our commercial farmers understand it? So the first slide that um, Shirley's put together was the uh, having a look at the current index versus the dose rate. So these animals here were dosed on 0.2 dose rate, and this is their range of uh, DPX indexes, so ranging from 1,200 down to around minus 500. Um, the so the first thing that we notice in this um, slide is that those at the higher dose rates tended to have the higher DPX, which is what we expect. So it's actually showing that it's, it's, it's actually relatively robust or working the way it should, but there's still this um, real concern from breeders about how much overlap, that some of these um, low dose rate flocks are getting quite high DPX, whereas some of the high dose rate are getting quite low DPX. And, and is that still the right thing? So 
can we make a bit of a, you know, a correction for that to, to reflect the dose rate that they're from? And so that's what this slide is about. We have uh, Shirelands modelled applying about a 200 cent um, penalty for uh, being a lower dose rate. And so the colours here at the bottom are the low dose rates, and you tend to be at the lower end of DPX anyway, but just push down a wee bit further. So where they were, um, oh, where they were 3,000 before, um, the blues are staying at 3,000 with this because they've got no penalty, so they're where, they were where they were. But if you're at a low dose rate of, say, 0.35, that uh, where you were 3,000, now you've dropped down to around 2,200 units in DPX. Now, there is still the spread, so why do we think these animals that are on a low dose rate could still actually legitimately be up here? We've actually looked into these animals, and we know, Sharon has anyway, and had looked to see that their progeny themselves have been measured at the higher dose rate, so there's a lot of confidence behind the figures for these values. So even though these rams are tested at a low dose rate, their progeny tested at a higher dose rate has um, lifted their breeding values up. So um, they are pretty confident that they should be, should be sitting up there. Um, so this is the current proposal. So just to think about a ram that fails at a 0.6 dose may have passed or could have passed at a 0.4 dose, but we don't know. But just to re, you know, the other is can, reverse can be true. A ram that passes at a 0.4 dose could have passed at a higher dose rate. And I think Russell Prophet's had a chance at looking at that with one of his rams and finding um, it was passing, um, but that won't always be the case. Just to remember too that a ram that fails but his brothers pass, or his progeny pass, um, will drop in DPX less than other rams that fail. So this worry about getting one ram that's failing at 0.6, dropping right down and getting a more um, harsher penalty than, than a lower um, dose rate animal, um, if his relatives are doing well, he won't drop so far. And just a, w one other thing we talked about is we really just need more animals tested would really improve the robustness of DPX. And just consider that when you're at young rams, you can test three times, well, up to three times more of them um, just because they're smaller from the, um, the dose rate that Sporodesmin you're spending. So the same amount of money um, that you're spending on your to-do, so if you actually tested three, you could test three times more of them as young lambs. So just think about that to look after your DPX and the rams that you're choosing. It doesn't have to cost you more necessarily. Um, yeah, okay, so you're testing some animals you're not going to use, but they were cheaper to test, so it still um, yeah, looks after both things. Uh, and then the connectedness challenge, just to recommend, uh, sorry, this is more than one minute, but anyway, um, a crossbreed, a cross dose, and connectedness is a challenge. We know that. Odafiti progeny test was um, offered some connectedness, but only on one trait, so we wanted to do something better. Uh, and we think the SI referencing schemes are really where that's going to have to be um, at, or uh, we can support more of that. We want to encourage more measurements. Perhaps this, this idea of um, doing the cull lambs being tested at a safe region, perhaps down south somewhere. Um, and that would help and, and if we also bring in the um, getting more leverage out of the phenotypes by using genomics, that could help too. But we estimate uh, this, these sorts of ideas will cost around 300,000 um, to adequately test rams and, and lift this up. So it's, um, it's not a ch an easy thing to do and we need to find out how to fund this, but it is part of our, you know, carbon dioxide funding to put that in. Yeah. To be honest, you've, your, your methane money has already been spent as part of that um, longer term thing, yeah. So. And we've been spending your money for about the last 15 years on it. Yeah. So that's FE, in a nutshell. No, Odafiti is not carrying on, it was exited this uh, last year, so we did the final tests. Um, we didn't do any mating in 2019. They wanted to exit and we thought we want to see if so we could do something better too. Yep, Leon? Just letting the group know, at the last meeting we had, we had talked about a concept where the North Island breeders put their um, FE size to some lambs, put 10 lambs from each sire and send them south to a farm clear, and then have them tested and killed in the process of those killed lambs, then pay for that referencing site. It was a concept that we, we thought had some yeah. merit. And this so is the one we're costing out. Yeah. yeah. So it would be lower cost and would get more information from more rams, but they'd actually have to come south to the safe zone, be on farm, then tested and sorted through to get that data and get the meat data out of them too. Yeah, yeah. so that's still a live discussion we're having. Still getting a bit of funding for it. 
Okay, so we'll just stop the tour of your feet. Sorry, Dan, I'm, um, right. I'll let Dan to the, oh, that's the slide down. Oops. Yep. Um. Cool. Cool, thank you. So first off, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for your um, input and your, uh, and your questions and things today. Um, I'm going to steal two minutes of your time, though, to talk about something that's really important to us at Beef and Lamb, as well as Beef and Lamb Genetics. Um, the freshwater uh, proposal, the National Policy Statement on Freshwater, which is uh, out there at the moment, which no doubt you've heard about, um, we're making sure that we get in front of as many people as we can uh, to talk about this at the moment. The chance to have our say on it, our say as farmers and as an industry, is, ends at the end of this month. And I really, 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 really strongly encourage you to take the opportunity to have your say because it's farmers like you guys having your say that'll make a difference. We can do our bit around the back door and talk with officials and um, get in front of ministers and do all of those hard work things that people uh, in Wellington have certainly been doing. But what we really need is a groundswell of people to say, hang on, this isn't fair, it's not right, and it's not going to achieve what you want to do. So there's a couple of big, big key points. Um, the first off is the grandparenting provision. So when I went farming, I had a look at what my old man was doing and changed plans a little bit, did a little bit differently. Um, under this, we wouldn't be able to do that. He did that when he took over from his father and for Adam for Knighton, right, this is what we do. We look at markets, we change our farm system to suit the farm markets. Sometimes we take from over here to pay over there and we need that flexibility and this grandparenting will take that away from us. Um, we, um, it, it's not fair the way it's set up. So high emitters and low emitters are all treated the same. And what we all agree that we want to have healthy rivers and those sorts of things. And so we need solutions that will actually achieve that rather than just being a blanket so that um, people can say we did something rather than we did the right thing. So um, go to our website. There's a number of ways you can, um, you can make your submission. You can do it. There's some templates there where you can fill in a lot of your own data. There's a new template up there where you literally can just put your name and say, this is what Beef and Lamb thinks, and I agree, if that's what you um, want to do, or somewhere in between. Um, those stories about what you do, perhaps what you did in the past, and you wouldn't be able to do under these, um, these situations, the cost to your farm, are the things that will make a big difference when someone's sitting in Wellington uh, having to go through those submissions and think about what they're going to do with them. Um, uh, so they'll be really important. So, so do make sure you do that. Um, a number that scares me, being from the King Country like I am, the Waikato Waipa catchment. Local government, NZ, did some research and 86, oh, sorry, 68% of the hill country will go to pine trees. Um, which for those of us who are farming, those of us who are veterinary, so those of us who are servicing farms, those who are bureaus, so that's everyone, right? That's not just the farm that's impacted, that's entire community. So, I um, really encourage you to, to, to take the effort. Um, if you're like me and you haven't got around to doing it yet, jump on the website, she's pretty easy, uh, and get it done by the end of the month. Otherwise, have a great evening. Uh, thanks for your time. Appreciate your input. Really appreciate you coming along uh, and looking forward to spending some time with you all and um, moving forward. The good news is all the good hard work you guys are doing to help at the front end. Cool. Take care. Drive safely.